Welcome to this Art Unluck talk and thank you to Art UK for having me. My name is Hannah Williamson and I'm one of the curators at Manchester Art Gallery. We are located right in the centre of Manchester in the northwest of England. And here is the gallery. It's a sunny day and our tree is in full leaf and you can see how lucky we are to have this beautiful building designed by Charles Barry in 1824. It's not a purpose-built gallery, however. You are looking at the front of the Royal Manchester Institution for the Promotion of Literature, Science and the Arts. When the building was opened in 1834, it housed all three. There were chemistry labs in the basement. When you ascended the steps and passed between those tall ionic columns, if you kept going straight ahead, you came to a huge lecture theatre. The city's art school was housed in the building, although the students sketching the plaster casts did complain about the fumes coming from the basement. And once a year, there was an exhibition with a painting purchased annually for the small resident collection. In short, this was a cultural hub for the city. However, cultural hubs can be expensive to run. So when in 1882, the Royal Manchester Institution offered to give this building and its collection to the Corporation of Manchester, this was not just a generous offer. It was also a neat cure for what became a financial headache for the institutional governors. In 1882, Manchester was over its shock city years when rapid industrial growth had led to urban squalor, injustice and cold hard cash. By this time the city was ameliorating its more outrageous social wrongs, educating its citizens and beginning to plumb their outside toilets. A mature and modern city needed a public gallery to show to the world. The popular desire for art had been demonstrated with the Manchester Art Treasures Exhibition in 1857. So when in 1882, the Royal Manchester Institution gave its building to the people of the city, the gift was willingly given and gratefully received. Now, I want you to imagine that you are going up those steps through the grand portico. You will enter the double height entrance hall. Uh, you can see it behind um, the pediment from the outside here. You're going up the stairs and you're turning left to enter our first gallery. Ah, and welcome to the gallery. This room is called What is Manchester Art Gallery? Which is a good question. In the end, we boiled down our suggested answer to what reads like a mathematical formula. People plus art equals gallery, which is written on the wall behind you here. Not many people in at the moment, though. Uh, looks like you've got the room to yourself. You can see the gallery's very varied collection with costume in the foreground. Uh, it's actually a 1980s CND t-shirt there, plus ceramics, glass, metalwork, furniture, prints, paintings, and what you might call miscellaneous. Turning round now to look behind you, and to the right, there is more. We have lighting and drawings and photographs too. Altogether, there are nearly 50,000 items in Manchester's collection. That's rounding up slightly and very much not counting all the separate buttons in the 100,000 strong button collection. We would never claim that any display of the collection is permanent. In fact, Already, can you see the photograph of the Ian Curtis lookalike there by um, Slater Bradley has already come down to be replaced by a painting. However, this particular room in Manchester Art Gallery is a good place for us to have a virtual look around because it is our introductory gallery. We use it to display a full range of works from the collection with a variety of different acquisition stories. The idea is that it makes you enter the other collections displays with a question in mind. What is Manchester Art Gallery? And what is the use of this enormous, beautiful, messy, quirky, impressive collection? 
and so to our first pictures. We've turned around again in the gallery now to look at the wall immediately to the left of the door. I wanted to show you two of the paintings that we'll look at today together like this, as it makes me laugh to interpret the sideways look in Ira Aldridge's eyes in this context. Is he looking askance at contemporary art? Or is he just looking towards the door in a bid to escape his perpetual burden of being always first? It's a lot to carry on your shoulders, always being introduced as the first picture. And you can imagine that he is ready to exit the room and try his luck with a different context. Here he is close to. This is Ira Aldridge as Othello, the Moor of Venice by James Northcote, painted in 1826. Ira Aldridge, renowned Shakespearean actor, is in character. His eyes express the mistrust of Othello with their jealous glance to the side. This was the first picture acquired by the Royal Manchester Institution. Do you remember I mentioned their annual painting purchase? This was the first one bought from their first exhibition in 1827, before the gallery building was even constructed. The governors noted it simply as the best executed painting in the show. After all, Northcote was a big name, renowned for his history and subject paintings. That is what this painting originally was, a subject, a character from the stage, not a portrait. Its title has changed over the years since it was painted from Shakespearean tragic hero Othello to simply a Moor, and now to Ira Aldridge as Othello. The title shrunk and grew as the painting story was forgotten and remembered, but it has always been the first painting. It's worth zooming in, isn't it? Uh, to see the doubt in his eyes, the mistrust of his mouth, and the glimpse of is it gold lace? Is it brocade at his throat? In later years, the mythical reasons for the purchase developed. Manchester enjoyed feeling that it has always supported enslaved people. New York born Aldridge was known for his anti-slavery campaigning on stage. So it is possible that the institution had this political stance in mind when they bought the painting. If they did, they did not make this explicit. It really seems that racist assumptions led to an unsubstantiated link between the first painting and the city of Manchester's proud anti-slavery rhetoric. Aldrich had a successful stage career, touring to great acclaim all over Europe. There is evidence that he was better appreciated in Manchester than in London. Possibly he was so famous in this city that a painting of him did not need his name attaching. It was obvious. And from the first to the latest. So we come to Manchester Art Gallery's newest addition to the Art UK website. I wasn't even sure if it was allowed actually as how many paintings made of machine sprayed powder coated steel are on Art UK. This is Nicola Ellis's Dead Powder series, Yellow. I know what you're thinking. There's nothing yellow about it. That's true. It's grey. And that's why it hangs so well beside Ira Aldridge, playing off his grey background. It's not just one shade of grey though. Look closely and there is black, silver, pink, white, green. A whole variety of shades which are used to paint meter box covers and containers for street side electricals. Nicola Ellis is an artist from Greater Manchester. In 2019, she spent time in residence in a factory that makes steel enclosures. The firm, Gritherden & Co Limited, based in Darwin in Lancashire, spray coat their products with powder pigment. Any powder remaining at the end of the day is called dead powder. Ellis learned to operate the powder coating booth and at the end of the day she was given free reign to use offcuts of steel and leftover paint. 
However, you mustn't get the idea of an artist creating havoc by mucking around with leftovers. The intricacies of Ritherden's factory system became important to Ellis. To hear her explain their approach to efficient working is to hear in her voice a tone of respect, even awe. She is playing and finding and experimenting, but from a position of admiration for an exemplary work culture. The title yellow comes from the colour of the button that resets the pump in the paint shop. One afternoon, she had just begun to operate the paint spraying booth alone for the first time, when suddenly sirens began to sound and lights flashed. Panic was the obvious response, but when she ran to find the supervisor, he looked at her calmly and spoke the single word, yellow. He walked methodically over to the paint shop, depressed the yellow button, thus resetting the pump, and silenced the sirens. Yellow became for Ellis a word symbolic of that moment, of a shared underlying system behind the life of the factory, of communicating in order to problem solve. Here's a close-up so that you can appreciate the texture of the painting with its sideways drips. We consider that this painting is linked to the Northcote painting of Ira Aldridge by way of an underlying factory system. Industry is intrinsic to who we are in Manchester, whether it makes the money that buys the paintings or whether it makes the paintings themselves. Actually, money is the link here too, or rather it's philanthropic use. This is one of the most recent paintings acquired by the gallery. It was a gift from the Manchester Contemporary Art Fund, a group of about half a dozen contemporary philanthropists. Philanthropy is key to a public collection, both in James Norcott's and Nicola Ellis's time. So that's a few answers to our question. What is Manchester Art Gallery? It's industry, philanthropy, and stories that are half myth. And now, as they say, for something completely different. This is Lilac and Gilda Rose by Gluck, painted in the early 1930s. The Lilac and Gilda Rose are arranged in the spectacular style of Constance Spry, London florist to the rich and famous. Spry was different to other flower arrangers. She promoted herself as an artist, not a tradesperson. She treated flowers as characters with personalities that needed to be brought out uh, in an arrangement as if she were painting their portrait. The artistic self-belief which Spry brought to flowers must have endeared her to Gluck, the painter, the two were lovers when this picture was painted. Gluck's artistic passion was white hot. The cool harmonies of these flowers belie the intensity of feeling that she put into the painting of them. But she felt all of her paintings in this way. The arrangement of shapes and colours was a life, life and death matter to her. In fact, it was probably Gluck's tendency to obsession that made her less famous in the long run uh, than the beauty of her paintings might eventually have made her. As she grew older in the 1950s and 60s, she waged a single-minded and single-handed campaign to improve the quality of artistic materials, specifically the smoothness and longevity of her favourite brand of oil paint, Rownies. Her constant letter writing and experimentation with materials eventually led to a neglect of her actual painting practice. I imagine Gluck would have uh, felt very uncomfortable with this free-for-all way of viewing her work. She wanted total control of her paintings, even inventing a special system to make her canvases seem to float framelessly. This was achieved by a painting uh, stepped profi profile frames uh, the same colour as the walls. Like so. 
You might be uh, wondering if it's a terrific coincidence that our wall just happens to match the frame of lilac and gilda rose. However, I'm afraid you're not looking at an original Gluck frame here. Uh, it's just a 1980s knockoff, so we were free to cover it with the wall paint of the gallery. The design is correct though. Our enjoyment of this serene and shining painting today is thanks to Gluck's mother. Her daughter had rejected what she saw as the conventions of her wealthy London family, along with her first name. She lived as what we might now recognise as being without the rigid limits of gender. Her mother was obliged to watch her daughter's career from a distance. Pretending to be a rich American patron, she purchased and donated this work to Manchester through an agent. But below Lilac and Gilda Rosie, you can just about see this painting. The Hireling Shepherd by William Holman Hunt, painted in 1851. It's quite a contrast to the pale, elegant flowers. Hunt wished to show the fleshy reality of his shepherd and shepherdess. He gave them robust sinews and rosy cheeks as a direct challenge to art historical convention. If Hunt had followed precedent, he would have been painting pale skin and flouncy dresses. Instead, there are ginger mutton chop whiskers and a cider keg. Essentially, what is going on here is a cynical comment on work. The shepherd has been temporarily hired to mind a flock of sheep. He is not doing a good job because the sheep are eating corn, which is bloating and eventually killing them. Can you see beyond the trees? I don't know if you can at the right there at the back, the small head of a sheep that looks like it's almost swimming through the ripe wheat. If you can't see that one, if your screen is too small, there's a sheep just entering into the wheat field. It's very dangerous for sheep health. Look at what the shepherd is up to instead of working. He's found a moth, which is naturally patterned with a uh, death's head on its back, and he's trying to spook his girlfriend with it. She is looking sceptical, but still leaning her body into his. Later on in his life, Hunt put forward a church allegory story for this painting, in which the shepherd stands for the clergy, distracted by mysticism and a ritual, while his flock strays and comes to harm. There it is in its frame. There is a link between these two very different works by Gluck and Hunt. And it's not just that both artists were very interested in how their works were framed. Look at the ears of wheat on the frame here. It's a lesson to us really in that what surrounds a painting is important. Context is everything. Both Gluck and Hunt were also extremely concerned with the materials that they used to paint and the longevity of their works. They both wanted to have their art preserved for eternity so that their vision could continue after their death. I guess that's what we're engaged in in the art gallery business as well, keeping things for future generations. But we must not imagine it's easy to sort out the things that should be kept from the things that should not. This painting is a perfect example. It was not always the much loved and familiar pre-Raphaelite gem that it is now. Sometimes it's easy to forget that paintings we now think of as old favourites were difficult to stomach when new. Certainly, the pre-Raphaelites did not come easy to Manchester. In their day, even the name that this group of Victorian painters gave to themselves could arouse suspicion. Pre-Raphaelites was tongue-in-cheek, implying that they were getting back to the real painting before 1500 when art lost its way. In 1851, Hunt was advised by the organiser of the Massive Art Treasures exhibition not to use the term pre-Raphaelite when up north. It was just too ridiculous. Manchester did not always love the pre-Raphaelites. We acquired this painting in 1896 when it was already 45 years old. And here's a painting that was not popular when it first came into Manchester's collection. 
This is 1932, O Chabote by Ben Nicholson. Of course, Nicholson's now valued as one of the leading lights of British modernism, but I don't suppose it was a done deal at the time. We're looking um, into the window here of the Puss in Boots shoe shop in Dieppe, northern France, or at least that is the window, but there are no shoes. And um, are we even looking in? Perhaps the jug on the table is in front of the writing on the window? And why is there a disembodied head on the left? Is it Nicholson's companion Barbara Hepworth standing beside us? Well, I can't answer those questions, which are really based on a description of the painting by Nicholson himself, as he explained the different planes of vision he had painted as seen in a shiny shop window. I enjoy the focusing and refocusing of my eyes while trying to tune into the imaginative world that he's created between the reflections here. And that is what we're increasingly about at Manchester Art Gallery. Not telling answers, but enjoying the questioning and the interacting that art can bring. I can't even tell you much actually about this work's controversial acquisition story. Uh, it's, it's still a, a sore point in some quarters, even though it came into the collection in 1948. Suffice to say that perhaps the imaginative world created was a little too mysterious for some members of the city council. Uh, when approval was sought, it was not given unanimously, and yet the curator of the time went ahead and made the purchase anyway. Sometimes when we ask, what is Manchester Art Gallery? What we're really asking is, who holds the power to decide what a public collection contains? As you will have gathered, what connects these paintings is that all six works I've chosen are part of a display entitled, What is Manchester? Art Gallery. For many people in Manchester, Adolf Vallette's works are a big part of the answer to this question. The gallery has the best of his oil paintings, that is, the series of cityscapes made between 1908 and 1912. This is India House, painted in 1912. Vallette came from Saint-Étienne, near Lyon, in southeast central France. He trained in Lyon and Bordeaux and came to England at the age of 28 in 1905. No one really knows why. Perhaps he came to further his career as a commercial artist, as he got a job designing labels for bales of cotton. He enrolled at the Manchester School of Art as a student of life drawing, uh, but after a year he was promoted to teach the class. Enrolling beside him, by the way, uh, was a fellow student, Lawrence Stephen Lowry, who was not considered so talented. Uh, Bellette then taught here until his return to France to care for his sister in 1928. This is my favourite Vallette. Perhaps because of the way the railway arch uh, frames it at the top, perhaps because of the beautiful dusty blue haziness or maybe the reflections, it, it somehow allows my imagination to play uh, like it can with the different planes of the Ben Nicholson we just saw. India House was a packing warehouse, it's apartments now, uh, and this view is the unornamented back of it. But Vallette has turned a view that lots of people in the city knew, and still know, in fact, um, into a place in which you can dream. Uh, Vallette painted a dirty, busy city. The River Medlock in 1912 was a heap of mud, rats and litter. And as you can see by this photo I took a couple of weeks ago, it still is. India House is the one with the, the green plastic covering its scaffolding there, by the way. But um, This is what the artist wants us to see. A melancholy, impressionist dreamscape. Uh, this, in fact, is the image I want to finish on, not my ugly photograph, because there is room to dream in this painting. And maybe that's the answer to the question which we are asking, what is Manchester Art Gallery? Perhaps it's just a place where everyone can use art to see the world differently. Thank you very much. <laughs>